Hey, hey, what's going on, everybody? JT here. We've got David, we've got C Will, and we've got the great Mark Yusko joining us for episode 47 of the next block. And boy, what a wild week it's been. So, uh, you know, we've got, I think, the third bank collapse in a week. We've got the Fed bailing out these banks, ensuring that the depositors are made whole. We've got a lot of the startup community kind of, uh, you know, going crazy over the weekend. So, a lot to talk about. USDC crashed down to 88 cents and is now about back at a dollar. But, uh, yeah, I mean, looking forward to this chat. Thanks for joining us, Mark. No, great to be here. And as I said, it, it's it's much better that we're doing this today instead of Friday. Friday, technical term, sucked. Oh, uh, yeah. It was a bad day. And, uh, you know, thankfully, calmer heads prevailed over the weekend. And, you know, I I won't say I knew they would, but I, I was pretty, pretty sure that they would. You know, one thing that most people don't, know or think about is, you know, there's a small group of people called the Council on Economic Stability that, that meets every Sunday. And it's made up of some really powerful, influential people, the Secretary of Treasury and the head of the Fed and the big banks. And and if they don't have anything to talk about, it's a short meeting and they all go have dinner. And uh, if there's lots to talk about, usually big things happen on Sunday yeah. night. So you go back to gold financial crisis, you know, Bear Stearns collapsed on Friday and on Sunday it got bought by J.P. Morgan. Then Washington Mutual collapsed on Friday and it got bought by J.P. Morgan on Sunday. And it's always on Sunday, right? Because the markets are closed and they can kind of decide who gets to do what. And then things are more calm when the markets open. And, and this time I was actually pretty sure the same thing was going to happen, that you know, J.P. Morgan was going to swoop in and and uh, take uh, SVB. I mean, SVB is a national treasure, and I, yeah. I mean that in the most sincere way. It's it's a bank that that you know basically the vast majority of early stage founders use when they when they start up. It's what most venture capitalists use to run their businesses, and you know this bank has basically been an, a paragon of institutional support for innovation and wealth creation for decades. And, you know, it's trying to be painted now by the politicos as some, you know, institution catering to the rich tech elites right. on the coast. That is such horseshit. I mean, total horseshit. This serves, you know, the woman who, who had the post that I retweeted over the weekend, you know, she's got two disabled kids. She started an app to help other families with disabled kids and she's trying to make payroll and that's who banks at SVB. And, you know, you got a little firm like us in North Carolina that has 30 plus funds and we have a little bit of cash in the funds to pay bills and, and we use the money from SVB to, you know, uh, make the investments in founding companies and then we draw the, you know, pay back the credit line. You know, that's what they do. This is not some crazy, sad story that they make up to justify uh, causing the run. I mean, there are a lot of finger pointing going on as to who caused the run. It seems end, like a very pointed attack towards crypto friendly banks. Well, okay. Yes. Uh, we'll go there. We'll definitely <laughs> go there. And this is the thing SVB. It's not a crypto bank, right? It's a bank about servicing innovation and technology. Now, crypto happens to be where all the innovation, not all, a lot of a lot of the innovation yeah. and technological advancement is today. So yes, there's some overlap, but you know, like Silvergate, uh, okay, crypto-esque bank, kind of crypto friendly, you know, doing some business with jurisdictional people down in the Bahamas and some dicey right. stuff. Okay. But, but how about Signature Bank being taken over by the New York regulators? Yeah. Well, Signature Bank is another one, right? I mean, Signature Bank, massive, massive right. portfolio. Has nothing to do with crypto. Has to do with real estate. Has to do with traditional mm -hmm. commercial banking. Yes, they had a segment. Part of the problem for Silvergate and for Signature, more for Silvergate, less for Signature, there were some bad people doing bad things. And yeah. you know, I probably shouldn't say that, I probably get sued, but truth, 
is an absolute defense. I learned that mm -hmm. from my, my, my lawyer friends that if you speak truth and someone tries to say, oh, that's defamation. Well, if it's true, it's not defamation. Right? <laughs> right. If you say someone's tall and they Facts. happen to be tall, or if they, someone's short, and you, it, I mean, that's not a, it's not a criticism. It's just an observation of fact. So um, there's a lot of smoking guns and a lot of evidence about some bad things done by the people involved at, at Silvergate historically. And you want to follow the real story, go to Mark Cahode's, you know, Twitter feed, and he'll tell you all about, you know, Mr. Lane. So um, Signature Bank, it's more dicey, you know, were there some ties to FTX and the like, but there's no question that the, this, the announcement this morning on closing Signature Bank yeah. was, oh, it was a systemic risk because of crypto. Mm. Are you freaking kidding me? <laughs> Look at crypto was, relative yeah. to the systemic risk yeah. was their commercial loan portfolio. Fractionalized right. banking. Yeah, what, what's your take on that? Fractionalized, fractionalized banking is, I believe, one of the greatest inventions in mankind's history. Now, a lot of people say, no, it's horrible. I but think it's horrible. I, I, I think we've talked about this, right? I challenge anyone, name a country that you would live in that either doesn't have fractional reserve banking or has shitty fractional reserve banking. I'll wait, yeah. right? You can't come up with one. And that is, I believe, what differentiates the great countries of the world and the lousy countries of the world is the ability to have, because what fractional reserve banking does is it collects the assets of the community and allows you to reuse them when they're idle. Right. Okay. But it doesn't work if everybody tries then to take the assets back at the same time. We've all seen yeah. the movie, It's a Wonderful Life, and everybody's mm -hmm. there and like, I need my money. Like, well, yeah. how much do you need? Well, well, I need all of it. Like, no, you don't. You need to buy groceries and pay your yeah. rent. You don't need all of it. And your money's not here. It's in Sewell's house and JT's house. <laughs> and the Simpsons house. predict the Simpsons got an episode on this. It's, you know, we've, we've seen it over and over again. Yeah. And look, can you make a case that DeFi, pure DeFi, self sovereignty, no more fractional, no fractional reserve banking is superior? Yes and no. Why do I say no? Yes, you can say that you're no longer subject to bank runs, like what we saw on Friday. Okay. But you also lose on the ability to lever the capital base, right? If you have one-to-one -one coverage, right? Your money is in your Bitcoin, on your ledger. Mm -hmm. And it's not lent out, it's not borrowed, it's not invested, it's not, it's just sitting there. Well, then the only way it can actually go up in value is what? Devaluation oh, of the currency that you hold it in. Because one Bitcoin is one Bitcoin or mm -hmm. one algo is one algo. But we don't price Bitcoin and Bitcoin or algo and algo. Right. We price it in dollars or yen or euros. So the reason that numbers go up and to the right is because the currency we value them in is going down because right. we're creating more of them. And that's, and that's why I, I do believe some portion of your wealth needs to be outside the fiat system in these other stores of value to protect you against the fiat enslavement, which, man, that's a charge word, I know, but, but it really is because they can steal your wealth through, through inflation and 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 money printing so anyway i talk too much but no i do have yeah, another good, you know good, point good to ask with with fractional reserve banking um you know just researching i know in march of 2020 they basically put it down to zero how many reserves you need to have and that's the big issue i see i don't it's not overall fractional isn't bad but i feel like <laughs> they just allow too much of it it's like a bank doesn't have uh, see what, it's a great 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 point and see here's the thing if you think about how fractional reserve works, right? You give me a dollar and I take 11 cents 
and I keep it in the bank and I lend out 89 cents to JT. Then he deposits that 89 cents. I take 9.1 cents. So now I get 20 cents and I lend out whatever, 78 cents to crypto. And, and you can do that up to the point where somewhere between eight and 12 turns Ooh, is lot. a reasonable level of leverage in a fraction reserve system. But to your point, if suddenly I can lend a hundred cents and I have no reserves, well, that doesn't work, right? Yeah. Because now a tiny move in the value of those assets destroys my whole equity base. And mm -hmm. we did a, an interesting uh, podcast on, on Friday on, on uh, I guess it came out on Saturday on my, you know, we do this on the margin thing. And mm -hmm. it was great. Someone showed this, this perfect chart and on, it's, it's an asset liability chart. On the left-hand side, they had a green box. Those are your assets, okay? On the right side, they had a red box. Those are your liabilities deposits. See, this is, the, this is the weird thing about banks. Wait a minute. I thought, I thought deposits were assets. Those are my assets. Oh, no, 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 no. You put your money in the bank. It's not your money anymore. Yeah, not, your, uh, not your money, not your <laughs> bank. The bank's money. It's the yeah. bank's money. Now, you have an IOU, right? They have a liability to you. So you have an IOU, okay? And as long as the green is bigger than the red, you have a little gold box called equity. The problem is if the green value shrinks, well, what is the green? Well, the green are the loans or the investments. Yeah. So the bank can take that deposit and lend it to Sewell to buy a house, give him a mortgage. Well, if he buys a nice little house in a nice little neighborhood and he puts time into it and fixes it up, value goes up. If he buys a, you know, flipper house during a bubble, the price is going to go down and that's going to get impaired. Well, if your value gets impaired, you get a little black box. That's called uh-oh. Mm. And when the uh-oh exceeds the gold, okay, then the bank goes out of business. And so what happened here, or what, let's go back. So Go back to 1987. So in 1987, you had the savings and loan crisis. So you had, you know, all these green deposits, I'm sorry, all these red deposits coming in, turned into green assets, people making loans to all kinds of people, boomers moving all around the country, building, and you know, things were pretty good. Except some bad people stole a bunch of money. So they created the uh-oh, by stealing and they went to jail and bad people did bad things. And, and okay. So those companies all had to go out of business and there were bad loans made. And so that was bad. So then you go to the global financial crisis. That was different. Global financial crisis was you had lots, again, lots of deposits coming in. Okay. Lots of assets, people making loans. And they're like, you know, we could take these marginal securities. We securitize the loans, right? In the old days, I'd go to my bank and the banker would make me a loan. And he knew my house because he lived in my neighborhood. He knew kind of how much it was worth. He knew what my job was. So he knew I was good to pay principal and interest. Well, in the 2000s and 2010s, what did we do, right? We securitized all that. And we fractionalized it up and we sold it out. We tranched it all up into CMOs and CDOs and we added leverage. And so now suddenly you had all these securities and we've all seen the big short and uh, mm -hmm. the hot chick in the bathtub explains how this works. And uh, I can't think of her name right now. And I guess I should marry because you saw the Oscars last night. But <laughs> um, So what, now I got that image stuck in my head so I can't think. Um, <laughs> but uh so, so what happened was it wasn't bad people stealing. It was dumb people levering up bad stuff, thinking you could turn non-AAA stuff into AAA by packaging it up and reselling it, which 
again, that only works. They do in mortgages. He tries to, you know, uh, cash in. So everybody tried to cash in and suddenly it wasn't AAA. Well, the uh uh-oh in that case exceeded the goal, right? So the uh uh-oh, because the impairment of the assets, the assets shrink, the uh uh-oh gets really big and the gold goes away. So what'd they do? Government bailed out the banks. This was the difference. In that scenario, and this happened in Iceland, if the equity, the, the gold disappears, game over. Investors, management, you're all supposed to be toast. In Iceland, they shut them down. I mean, they wiped out the banks and they started over. In America, <laughs> because Hank Paulson was in charge and he was friendly with all the bankers. He's like, well, we'll just take 700 billion of taxpayer money and we'll give it to y'all and you'll be okay. Be no, more than okay. Supposed to work, <laughs> right? I mean, oh, it's inflation. Some people should have actually gone to jail because they were doing, you know, they, they didn't steal per se, but they kind of did some, some things that they shouldn't have done. So fast forward to today, this is very different. This is very different, right? What Silicon Valley Bank was, they weren't making risky loans to crazy homeowners. Like only 10%-ish of their assets were loans. And those loans are actually really safe. They're loans to people like me, where they lend me money against my LP's commitments into my fund. Hmm. So I, I draw the money from the bank. And then when I get to a certain amount, I call the money from the LP so they don't have to send me money every week. Mm -hmm. That's a really safe loan, right? Those loans are super safe. That was not the problem. The problem was after the global financial crisis, what happened? The Fed cut interest rates to zero. Well, why did they do that? Let's think about this. Why why did they do that? Well, they said they had to. They said it was was an emergency right? Emergency authorities. Again, why did they do that? Because the banking industry was bust. The gold had vanished. The assets had shrunk. The liabilities were the same. No equity. So what do we do? Well, we have to fix the balance sheet. Well, how do we fix the balance sheet? I got an idea. Cut the interest rates to zero. And that's the number that banks borrow from the Fed. Like I'll wager that everyone listening today, none of us get to borrow at Fed funds. I never met anybody who gets to borrow at Fed funds. That would be nice. Some bigger rate. You know, if you got a subprime loan, you're borrowing at 15, 16%. You know, if you're borrowing from your credit cards, it's 21 to 24%. It ain't zero. So the bank borrows at zero and they buy government bonds. Well, back then, government bonds were only yielding 2%, but two minus zero it's free money is free, free money, money. Yep. but better you can do that 12 times through fraction yeah. reserve you can lever it yep. up 12 times 12 times two is really good nice yeah. 24 right there and so Easy what money. happened was the balance sheets of the banks got really good then 2020 comes along well what happened in 2020 well 2020 whoo the world is locked down, everything's collapsing. And what do they do? Well, they say, well, this woman, Stephanie Kelton, says we can print as much money as we want and has no impact. No inflation, no, 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 no impact. Just creates wealth. Like, what the fuck? If that was true, <laughs> wouldn't every country in the world just print money? Yes. Some try yes. to. Yes, they would, but it's not Mm -hmm. true. What's true is wealth is created by entrepreneurs, people listening to this podcast, right? People who build stuff. Shout out to you. So so what happens is they printed 50% of all the dollars in the history of our republic in 18 month period, 247 years, 18 months, we doubled the money supply. Okay, what happens? Inflation, but it wasn't really inflation. It was currency devaluation, right? There wasn't an increased demand for goods and services and limited supply. It was that the money that we used to pay for stuff got less valuable. Yeah. So I take my son-in-law to lunch in Chapel Hill, North Carolina, and we have, 
you know, a quesadilla and three tacos and, and a side of guac and it's $50. And Five it don't taste zero? no better either. It's not mm -hmm. Paris. Yeah, and the portion is smaller. Smaller oh, yeah. portion uh, too. $7 for a, a thing of guac this big. I'm like $7? Take it back. Yep. I'm sorry, we can't take it back. But, but my point is, the food didn't get better. The portions actually got smaller. The food's actually really good mm -hmm. it's at this place. It's like a street taco. <laughs> so it's good. But it ain't worth $50. But it's not $50. It's $25. It's just worth half as much because there's twice as many dollars. So, yeah. so then what happens is we have this massive deficit because of the excessive spending. $3 trillion. Well, who's going to buy all those government bonds to finance the deficit? China said no, Japan said no, Russia said no, Belgium said no, Saudi said no. So who the fuck's gonna buy them? You, banks. I'm saying that's like me and You banks, us. here's the deal. In order for you to borrow at zero, you have to buy these bonds. Mm -hmm. So they're like, bring it. Now they're yielding 3%. Awesome. Pay zero, 25 basis points, get three, love it. JP Morgan, zero negative trading days. That's impossible. <laughs> Anyone who's ever traded has had a bad day. You can't have zero negative yes. trading days, but they were trading. They were doing arbitrage. So long story short, then what happens? So you've loaded up all the banks, not just Silicon Valley Bank, all the banks. And you guys have probably seen the chart, okay? The unrealized losses across the banking system is... Yeah. Like 600 billion or something. Exactly. Ginormous. And and it's not just Silicon Valley Bank. But but here's more money than it was in Seawell's house. The law of <laughs> not Constant. that much here. So, so here's here's what happens. So the Fed says, all right, the bank balance sheets are actually in pretty good shape, right? We 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 reliquified them over the last decade or so. So now we're gonna focus on the income statement. So now we're going to jack up rates. Depositor rates are sticky down. They're still zero, half a percent, cash making nothing. But now you banks can invest at four, five percent or lend at four or five percent. Awesome. The net interest margin, huge. So now your income statement. So if you look since October, the bank stocks were going crazy. Yeah. Yeah, look at him so now. Then so then what happens? <laughs> oh, good. Well, then freaking FTX happens. Well, what happened with FTX? Well, FTX, well, a lot of things happen with FTX, but the, the, the short version is FTX um, committed massive fraud by making up a bunch of stuff about a business that they never did, right? They were never yeah. an arbitrage firm. They were never the second largest exchange. They were a money laundering, or money laundering organization. So what they did is they stole money and gave it to political candidates. But in so doing, they pretended to invest in these arbitrage transactions. One of them happened to be Luna. So freaking my birthday last year, May 9th, you know, Luna comes to Terra, which I always found was ironic. And that <laughs> wipes out Earth, yeah. <laughs> three arrows capital, yes. right? Three yep. arrows capital gets wiped out. And here's the problem. You've heard the adage, if you borrow uh, $1,000, you got a banker. If you borrow a million dollars, you have a partner, right? So- Never heard that, but okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You, 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 wanna, you, 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 wanna, you wanna never have the bank be able to do anything to you, borrow a lot of money. Like a lot, a lot of money, because then like, okay. if you go down, they go down too. So, you know, if you owe a bank a thousand dollars, they'll beat you to shit. If you owe them a million dollars, they'll treat you like a king because they want to get that money back. So right. FTX uh, had borrowed lots of money from a lot of people, Celsius, Voyager, BlockFi, everybody. So what do they do? Like, oh shit, we just lost a lot of money. We're going to get found out that we're a fraud. Shit. We'll just buy the bank. So they made a bid for Celsius, got the books and said, oh, whoa, 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 whoa. This sell token is bad. Nope. You guys go down the toilet yourself. We'll go buy Voyager. So they did that. 
we'll go bail out uh, BlockFi. Well, then it turns out that they didn't have any money. All they had was this token, FTT. FTT token. So they said, well, hey, I got an idea. We'll swap good stuff like Bitcoin and Ethereum for this FTT because we own you now. So we, you have to do that. <laughs> so then we get to Operation Choke Point. Well, what's Operation Choke Point? So I will argue, and I have been arguing, people say I shouldn't argue this, but I'll keep arguing it, that um, Sam and Caroline were the masterminds of nothing. They were the useful idiots in a much larger uh, plan to basically cut off the access points to crypto from fiat. Why? Well, because the incumbents, the banks, like being the incumbents, and they don't like the idea that there is a better way through self-sovereignty and you know fiat. Because think about it. If I left my money in the bank two years ago, I made zero. If I converted it to a stable coin and deposited it at BlockFi, I made six. Yeah. If I turned into Bitcoin and deposited, I got eight. Six is better than zero. Yeah. A billion yeah. dollars leaves the banks, no one cares. Ten billion, kind of care. A hundred billion, now you're a problem. So how do you solve that problem? Well, you choke off all access points. So exchanges, you go after them. Lenders, you shut them down. How do you do that? With an organization that was mythical to begin with and had ties to the very people who are regulating the industry. Yeah, They were buddy-buddy. So then who's left? Silvergate, Signature. Silvergate got shut down. Now, maybe bad people doing bad things. Maybe they deserve to get shut down. Fine. Signature, not so much. I mean, maybe some bad stuff, but mostly not a, not a bad organization. But here's the weird thing. This weekend, Signature Bank didn't have a bank run. Mm -hmm. But they got swept up in the announcement that they took over Silicon Valley Bank. Yeah. How did that happen? Well, you heard the you saw the tweet today from the board member saying to send a message to crypto that this is about crypto. Crypto was systematically a risk to or, or was a systemic risk. Well, doesn't Silvergate level. bank with Binance? That that's what I mean. There are some bad people doing bad stuff and there's a bigger tale here and we haven't even gone down the rabbit hole of you know, who sold Sam, the original Alameda business? Yeah. CZ. Mm -hmm. um, yep. Where did the first check go from FTX to CZ? Who outed Sam? CZ? CZ. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, there's a whole bunch of weird stuff there that we can go down. But Yes, there was connections to Silvergate. And then there's also connections to Dell Tech Bank down the Bahamas and to Tether and, and a whole bunch of other stuff. So where does that leave us today? Where it leaves us is you now have a country who's afraid, right? People are afraid. Like literally, the average person in the street is afraid. Is my money safe in the bank? My wife's saying to me this weekend, we need to move all of our accounts. We, we can't be in these banks. I, it's yeah. fine. Okay. It's fine. Bank of America is not going away. I don't like Bank of America. I'm pissed off at them and I'm probably going to move, but, um, you know, they're okay. But, you know, right. for family harmony, we're going to open up a couple of new bank accounts and diversify. <laughs> um, <Family> harmony. <laughs> happy wife, happy life. Um, yeah, absolutely. So, but, you know, so we have, we have, we have a, a, a populace that's afraid. We have, uh, a populist opinion that the bankers saved the day, right? <laughs> that the FDIC came in and saved the day, saved the depositors. And they, and Biden came on this morning and said, we're punishing those evil investors. Again, who creates wealth? Politicians or investors? Investors. Investors. So the idea that you're punishing the investors no, what, what you're doing is you're trying to gloss over 
the fact that you, politicians, have a spending problem and a discipline problem and a money laundering problem, all right? Let's just track the money from Ukraine back to FTX, from <laughs> FTX to Alameda, from Alameda to good. SBF, from SBF to the Democratic Party. Really? Right. That's all yeah. on chain. And so you can't yep. accuse people. I'm not accusing anybody. I'm just, I'm looking at on-chain transactions. Like in the bad old days, if I wanted to, you know, have Seawill help me out with something, I'd meet him at the park. I bring my backpack. I leave it on the bed. He's like, hey, Mark, your backpack. I'm, I just keep walking. He looks at, shit, it's full of money. Okay, yeah. good. I'll help you. No way to trace that. But you send money on chain to FTX, to Alameda, to a shell company owned by SBF who makes a political contribution? Really? Yeah. That's, yep. that's, some, that's some wild stuff. And so why? why? Why would the incumbents want this to happen? Where's all the money going to flow to? From the regional banks, small banks, community to the big banks. Mm -hmm. Swim upstream. Or, or to the Saudis. Well, it's going to go to JP Morgan, Bank of yep. America, Wells Goldman. Fargo, you know, Goldman, Morgan Stanley. And it's just going to keep concentrating the wealth in those most powerful institutions. Look, here's the, here's the crazy thing. After the global financial crisis, uh, a large bank who shall remain nameless uh, called us up and said, we're no longer going to bank you because you know we got in trouble and we got to clear out all the small accounts and you guys are too small. So we went to Silicon Valley Bank back in 2008, nine, and they've been great to us. They've been incredible partners, unbelievable, um, just a joy to work with. So now that same bank called us on Friday saying, hey, remember us? Don't you want to bank with us? <laughs> Like, did you like literally divvy up the client list and like start calling people? I mean, yeah, crazy, really crazy stuff. Crazy. So, so one thing I would just, uh, you know, since you kind of recapped a lot that, that's happened, and obviously the last financial crisis we had kind of is what birthed Bitcoin, right? Bitcoin came from that. Mm -hmm. And obviously, you know, this even like on Friday, I put out a tweet, you know, what, you know, what do we think is happening? Is there any reason to be bullish on Bitcoin and stuff right now with all this banking? And this is before a lot of the safety nets were already starting to fall through and we you yep. know, had a little bit of relief. But um, one, what do you think is going to come out of what we're seeing right now? And two, are you shocked at the Bitcoin response to a lot of this happening is this is this CZ doing it again? He literally put out a tweet today or, or a post today saying he's going to move one billion of BUSD into Bitcoin, Ethereum, and Binance. So, like, where are we right now in the broader scheme of things about of what you, do you believe what's about to happen? No, look. So, so this is interesting. So last Wednesday, maybe uh, I took a picture of the back of Bitcoin Magazine. I don't know if you can see it, but yeah. it's an ad for bank, pay all your bills with Bitcoin from BitRefill. Hmm. And I sent it to my wife saying, look, if you're worried about the banks, maybe we could do some with this. And some you know, literally last, last Wednesday. And so Bitcoin is clearly going to be acknowledged as even more so as a way to opt out of this nonsense system as a means to store some of your value outside that system. In some cases, like BitRefill, they're going to say, well, we can pay your bills, right? I mean, not all your bills and not everybody will accept it, but, you know, that will, that will start to be the payment rails. Strike, you know, we're investors in Strike. That, you know, got a boost as people. Ledger, we're investors in Ledger, massive mm -hmm. new interest in, in holding your, your own keys. So, you know, I think happened in the last 48 hours with, with Bitcoin is huge short covering again. Um, you know, is it triggered by CZ? Is it triggered by, you know, people saying, shit, I got to get my money out of the 
bank and put it someplace short term. Yeah. Part of the challenge with BTC right now is the free float. It's just really small, right? So many coins haven't changed hands in, in over a year. Um, so it doesn't take a lot to move markets and particularly you know, on, a, on a short covering liquidation side. So I think that's most of what happened. Um, you know, these two big movements uh, look like short covering rallies to me. But I, I still believe, and, I, and I, I still stick to this, that look, I believe crypto winter ended June 15th last year, that crypto spring ends sometime mid-May-ish, because that'll be nine months ahead of, of the halving. And, you know, I, you know, I could be off by a week here, a week there, but, but that's, that's kind of how I view it. And, you know, there was a scenario with all the events of the past couple of weeks where you'd say, if you told me three months ago that the three biggest on ramps into crypto from fiat would be closed, that Bitcoin would be not at new lows. I mean, there are a lot of people on Twitter saying it it was going to eight or ten thousand guaranteed. Everyone, yeah. Yeah, I mean, yeah, really, everyone, really. <laughs> yeah. And um, you know, the fact that we're twenty four, that's interesting. That that's a lot higher than eight. And it doesn't mean we're out of the woods completely, but it does give me a pretty strong conviction that that we are. The technology hasn't changed. The reason for the technology and the adoption hasn't changed. The number of builders that I talked to hasn't changed. The excitement around new projects hasn't changed. The inevitability of the transition from TradFi to, to DeFi uh, and decentralization more broadly hasn't changed. But I, I do think the volatility is going to be with us for a while. Um, but I, I, I do like the price action in, in Bitcoin in the last 48 hours because that, that shocked a lot of people, right? Yep. Now, what are your thoughts or, okay. with that as well? Just what are your thoughts on the USDC DPEG and what we saw wow. there? That, look, that, again, some accuse me of being a tinfoil hat guy. I mean, I do have white <laughs> hair, but I don't even have to. I don't even have to wear a tinfoil hat. I mean, I always look like I have it on. But I will say, how do I say this politically correctly? I I believe that um, the SVB thing was was a hit. Yeah. I do. Um, I think it was a coordinated hit. Uh, I think having very high profile people tell all of their, you know, investment companies to withdraw cash. Yep. That's incitement of a run on the bank. That's literally walking into the theater and yelling fire. And right. I think it's incredibly irresponsible. And I'm, I'm appalled at that action from other people in the industry that I love. Um, but I think I think there's a complicity. I I think if you dig deeply into the layers of some of the people that wrote those memos and look at who they went to college and studied under and who they've backed and who they support politically, you'd be like, whoa, whoa, whoa. That's just too many coincidences. So I believe it was a hit job. And so and what was it hit on? What was it hit on uh, USDC and Circle? Hmm. Because you know, as of Friday, 20%, 15%, 15 of their cash was vaporized, right? Because again, what should have happened on Friday was when they announced that they were going to raise new equity and the street panicked and said, oh, these guys are in trouble, hit their stock price capitalism would say another bank would say all the assets they own are money good as long as we hold on to them and in fact i can probably even cut a deal with the fed to sell them to the fed because they're the buyer of last resort they'll probably even pay me par which is exactly yeah. what they did and so capitalism would have said jp morgan or somebody like them 
would have bought SVB and everything would have been fine. But that got blocked. They set up some haphazard FDIC takeover and said, no, we're not guaranteeing the uninsured. And like, what? On, on what planet is that a good idea? Because you're going to foment more bank runs. And then over the weekend, somebody came to their senses, or maybe it was all part of the plan. And I think there are a lot of people who thought, you know, USDC was going to break. And and I, I think there's. I a lot thought of it was going to break. Now a lot of people thought Tether was going to break too. Mm -hmm. Tether didn't break for even a minute. USDC nope. broke for a few hours, but uh, thankfully, calmer heads prevailed. And even though I don't love the structure. Um, I would have rather seen them taken over by a, a stronger institution um, and then unload the bad assets. No, they're not in bad assets. They're just temporarily impaired assets to the Fed. Look, Japan's been doing that for 20 years. They've been buying all the Japanese government bonds from all the insurance companies because you know they're at a loss. But that that could have been an easy, easy trade because they can hold them forever. Um, mm -hmm. So I, 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 I think USDC thankfully uh, lives to fight another day, but I don't think the, the war is over. Look, you guys know this. I've been talking about it. You know, this is the then they fight you phase. Yeah. Uh, started last year. Unfortunately, I think it goes a while. Like I could argue in, you know, a full six year cycle, like the first two, um, which will stink. But incumbents don't like to die. That's generally true. Um, but ultimately, superior technology has always won. There's not an example that you can find where superior technology was put back in the bottle. I think the VCR, the Blu-ray or DVD thing or something like that, that might have been the one yeah. loss. Well, but 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 all that was, was, was evolution. VCR was great. And then the DVD came or Blu-ray came. And then digital streaming was better. Yeah. And so it's, it's the evolution of the technology. I mean, you weren't going to get the you know, Blu-ray to say, no, we're not going to do Blu-ray. I upgraded from VCR to Blu-ray. And then Blu-ray mm -hmm. had a very short window because people were like, well, shit, why would I record when I can go straight to streaming? The problem so you with buy streaming, special DVDs. The, the problem with streaming was, you know, when Netflix first tried it, video on demand, it took four days to download a movie. No one is going to wait four days for anything, <laughs> right? No one. Not, not, I, mean, no. I mean, it took 40 minutes to do a song. At least you could you know, turn it on, you go to lunch, you come back, you had one song. And my MP3 player, you know, hold 10 songs. It was awesome. And, and it wasn't until Jobs invented the iPod that, you know, the, the industry was revolutionized. So, look, is... I, I, I told a story last, you know, I'm a part of the on-chain monkeys. So that, that's my thing. That's my I little I was about community. to ask about that near well, the it's end. It's my little community <laughs> I've, chose, I've chosen to be part of because I believe in, in their promoting good karma and rewarding people who do good in the world. I, I just like that. But what, what was really interesting about it is how easy and how fast and how permissionless it was for me, I was sitting at home the other day and, you know, they were about to do this inscription on Bitcoin and be the first collection on Bitcoin. I'm like, I'm going to go get a couple more Genesis uh, before that happens. And with literally five or six clicks on my computer, I was done. I didn't have to go to the bank. I didn't have to wait in line. I didn't have to wait two days for it to settle. It settled instantaneously. And that's just a superior way to move my money, my assets, hold my assets. Whereas, you know, if I money's in the bank, it's not my assets anymore. Right, right. So is, go ahead, JT. No, it's right. If you want to ask, and then I'll, I'll I, I do have a question, but if you want to jump in first. No, I was just making a comment because it is, like I was saying earlier, my, not your keys, not your crypto. It seems that if you send your money anywhere but yourself to custody, it is not your money. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. So, 
I want to move the topic a little bit off of crypto and actually just ask your opinion. So uh, we've got the CPI release coming out tomorrow uh, for February. Yesterday, uh, January was 6.4%. Uh, we have the Federal Reserve stepping in and sort of kind of, I mean, not the Federal Reserve, but the federal government sort of stepping yeah. in and injecting money into the system and sort of moving at odds with the Federal Reserve as they're trying to tighten. Uh, we've got the CME right over here. Let's look at this. That went from pricing in a 25 to 50, you know, 90 percent chance of a 25 basis point hike a month ago to about 69 percent chance of a 25 basis point hike and then a 31 percent chance of a 50 basis point hike. Then a day ago, that 50 basis point uh, hike chance increase went up to 40 percent. And then after today's news, it's now at zero percent and the chance of it staying where it is, uh, you know, at zero, you know, having a zero basis point hike, basically doing absolutely nothing is now 25 yeah. percent. So I, I really want to get your take on what you think the Federal Reserve's going to do, given the state of the the, the market right now, because it, it does seem like the government's moving at odds with what they're trying to do. Is this the point of reversal? Are we seeing the pivot being almost forced to happen before our eyes? It's a great question. Um, so a couple things on the inflation number. Uh, my guess is it comes in cold, not even cool, but, but cold. Uh, you know, the, the goods components of, of CPI, they've gone negative year over year, oil, used car prices. So my guess is that that element really drags down the, the the shelter component is rolling over but it's not negative yet um and again if, if you overlay money supply growth 16 months ahead that's that's cpi and and that actually uh is approaching negative numbers by the end of this year so you know, my guess is that that number will surprise to the to the downside uh which will take pressure off raising but Here's the thing. I, I don't believe any of the, the nonsense narrative of we're raising interest rates to fight inflation. They don't impact inflation, right? What, what, what caused that, that increase in CPI? Oil prices. How many you know, Fed raises or cuts is going to change oil prices? None. It's all about what Saudi Arabia decides to do. Um, what about price of wheat in Ukraine? They don't have any impact in that. You know, what about the price of natural gas in Europe? No impact on that. So what about, you know, housing prices? Okay, fine. You got some impact on that because mortgages, right? So if you jack up interest rates, you can impact the supply and demand of housing. All right, fine. Um, but generally speaking, I, I don't think they're trying to fight inflation. I believe the hike in rates was to reestablish capitalism you know, away from the broken system we had of zero rates and, and even negative rates in, in parts of the world, you know, negative interest rates, capitalism doesn't work, right? If I have to pay the bank to hold my money, then I'll just rather spend it. And that's good for consumption, but it's not good for investment and wealth creation. If you want to encourage investment wealth creation, you have to have a positive sloping uh, yield curve. And, you know, if, if you think about risk. If, if I'm incented to take no risk, then I'll take no risk. If I'm incented to take a lot of risk, I'll take risk. And if I'm compensated for those risks, then, you know, I might achieve something. So I, I think they were reloading the gun, shall we say, on the short end to try to get the ability for the next downturn in the economy to be able to cut rates and stimulate uh, growth again. All that said, growth isn't all that great, right? I mean, growth is mediocre this quarter. It probably won't be negative. It, it was looking like it was going to be negative, but looks like maybe it'll it'll come out, you know, slightly positive because we had such a mild winter. Um, but I I don't expect a big pivot. Will they back away from the fifty basis points? Probably, probably. Is that a pivot? No. If you raise 25 basis points, that's still a raise, right? That's not a cut. That's not increasing liquidity to your point, JT. Um, and the FDIC guaranteeing depositors isn't really doing anything other than, you know, 
socializing the, the unrealized losses on the bond portfolio. So that's not increasing money supply. So the, 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 the false narrative that's going around is you, you've seen the, the chart about financial conditions. And since October, everybody's like, oh, look, the financial conditions are so much uh, looser. No, no, they're not. All that does, that particular index measures stock prices. So yeah, stock prices went up since October. And so financial conditions look looser, but they're really not because money supply is still shrinking and the Fed is still doing QT. So until the, until the Fed stops selling bonds, which they might have to now, right? Because if all these banks can't buy any more bonds, who's going to buy them? So that, that's an interesting thing to watch is does the Fed balance sheet actually stop contracting? That would be the first signs of a pivot. And then what is your thoughts on like if we do see a pivot here soon, you know, what do you think would follow? Because I've, I've seen a lot of people charting that, you know, after the Fed pivots, obviously you have a high, higher probability, I guess you could say, of a recession or of things going, you know, the yep. opposite way, obviously. Then, yep. So what are your thoughts there? Yeah, for sure. I mean, look, you, you only cut interest rates if things are getting worse, right? That That's how it works, right? You raise interest rates when things are getting better normally, not this time. Um, <laughs> and you you cut them when things are getting worse. Now, the, the, the one thing that's missing uh, from the analysis is the amount of liquidity being created by China. So China is creating massive liquidity, over a trillion dollars since October, and that's finding its way into global markets. And I think that's part of where some of the support for crypto has come. Um, so, I would expect as China continues to reopen and expand their liquidity base, that could overrule the EU and the US uh, continuing to, to tighten. So I think we got to watch global liquidity. And there's a, a firm called Cross Border Capital that does a really good job on that. Nice. I'll have to tap into that resource. Absolutely. Absolutely. Do we have any further uh, questions for our, you know, our guest here? Do we want to check the chat real quick? I think we might have some uh, coming through. Definitely in the chat. seen some there. There was also one thing, one thing I just wanted to pick your brain on. And that's, um, you know, th you have the, you know, the six year kind of phases and we're in that, then they fight you phase. Yeah. Um, obviously, you know, however long that takes to, you know, win or get out of that to the, you know, then you won. Right. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. Yep. What, what do you, you know, and obviously it's just hypothetical, you know, trying to guess what that looks like, you know, is that, um, you know, getting to a Bitcoin as world reserve, like, you know, something yeah. that the dollar was, or, you know, what, what does it look like after a lot of this fighting is done, especially looking at a lot of these banks, which are right now fighting, clawing to try to take more market share and buy up the smaller ones. And, yep. you know, obviously they don't, the incumbents, they don't want to leave, um, you know, but what does it look like? These, so, are, all, these couple, are all bank couple, stocks, by I, the way. I think these cycles are, are much longer than, than we, we really think about. And, you know, when, when the pound sterling was the world reserve currency, you know, 75 ish years, uh, they started their demise kind of interestingly in the same year that, that we created the fed 1913, they invaded Mesopotamia, they incurred a bunch of debt, the pound sterling collapsed. We ascended with the creation of the new monetary system. But it took 31 years to change officially from the pound sterling as the world reserve currency to the dollar. And, and I think the same is true here is I, I actually believe that the next iteration won't be Bitcoin as the world reserve currency, but rather the renminbi. I actually think China wants to be the world reserve currency. Now, they are a reserve currency today. Central banks around the world can hold renminbi. They'd have to open their capital account completely, which they're loath to do at this point. But my guess is they will get there and then they'll make a bid to displace the dollar. They're already doing it in the sense that they're cutting deals with Russia and India and Japan yep. to price oil and other commodities in, in those local currencies and not dollars. But all the while, the way I look at, at Bitcoin and, and other digital assets is it's creating an alternative financial system. And so I think it, it continues to be relatively small. I mean, still a trillion-ish dollar on a you know, $100 trillion global economy. 
So it's still pretty small. But as it evolves, you know, let's say we get to gold equivalents at five trillion, then we could get to, you know, kind of uh, a, a, a world reserve currency it could be included in world reserve bank balances the same way gold is or the euro is or the renminbi is. And then, you know, do we have to wait the full 70 year cycle for the renminbi? Eh, probably not. Maybe cycles are shorter this time. Um, is it possible the renminbi never gets there and, and we do go to Bitcoin because it's a better form of money, right? It's a better form of gold. Yeah, but I guess where I come out is I think it's more likely that Bitcoin becomes the base layer the way gold is and that all the other fiat layers then still exist, but they just turn into CBDCs, which are really going to suck because then you got surveillance and control and programmability and and all the nightmare dystopian scenarios that we've all seen, you know, the big guy at uh, BIS talk about, uh, Augustine. Do you think this um, is all part of the plan to uh, continue to usher in a CBDC? Because it almost seems yeah. uh, like that's the case. I mean, with the uh, with the federal government coming in and basically backstopping and insuring all deposits, it's, it's almost essentially de facto nationalizing the system in a way anyway. Uh, so, uh, you know, what... Isn't the yeah, next you're lock- saying it exactly right, JT. And look, I, I tweet this out all the time. What if this is all part of the plan? I, I think it is. I, I really do. I, I If you wanted to create something that people were afraid of, like a CBDC, and people are rightfully afraid, right? What would you do? make them more fearful of what they currently use. Exactly. Exactly. (laughs) Exactly what you would do. You would make the alternatives that they're comfortable with today seem terrible. And that would include the traditional financial system, which we've got plenty of reminders of how bad that can get. Yeah. And then or that it could prevent stuff like the 2000. Like I literally saw a tweet. I even retweeted. It was quant network. It was there someone within their group saying he was on record saying, you know, if we had CBDCs back in 2008, we could have prevented a financial crisis. And so it's like all they have to do is manufacture a bigger and worse financial crisis that, quote unquote, CBDs can come in and solve. I mean, similar. It's all I mean, disinformation. It's, yeah, right? it's it's the Ministry of Disinformation, and look, we we could go all the way down the dystopian rabbit hole on this, but <laughs> but it's it's real. And look, I get it. Governments like to be in charge. Politicians like to be in charge of governments, and big donors like to be in charge of politicians. It's been true for millennia, and that ain't going to change. Now, one of the interesting things is this technology you know, digital asset technology actually gives us the tools to break free and not to be overly hyperbolic, but it's true. As much as the printing press broke us free from the hand of the church, right? The church ruled our lives. We were illiterate. We listened to church leaders. They owned us. They taxed us. They told us how to think. They told us what to think. They told us when to think. They gave us things. They took it away. And then the printing press came along and was like, oh, shit. I can talk to the people around the world and I can gather information and I can become learned and I can challenge the status quo. Then state-owned media and government, you know, influenced media took over for a couple generations. And then the internet busted that wide open. And now people can exchange information in real time. We don't have to wait for, you know, Walter Cronkite to tell us what to think. Although and, some of the uh, Twitter files are showing us they're trying to claw back some of that ability for us to free, uh, no, freely no, speak on the internet amen. as well. So, guys, I gotta I gotta jump to a, a client meeting, but Absolutely. enjoyed it as always. Uh, I wish yeah, I thanks for coming on the show. Tropical, like, uh, like oh yeah. There for the show and, <laughs> this is uh, this will be when I actually sell the top next time. Yeah, I'll, yeah. I'll actually be there. <laughs> but no, uh, Mark. Me, yeah, thanks so much for coming on. All right, Mark, it's been fantastic. And, uh, we'll see you again soon. Awesome. Yep. Take see care, Mark. Take care, guys.
All yeah, right, everybody. Great, great discussion. I mean, obviously, you know, it was great to hear his kind of recap of everything from, you know, just where we're at, where we obviously possibly could go. Um, I'm definitely still a little nervous on, you know, this bounce that we're seeing in the markets. It definitely caught me a little by surprise. I thought we might see a small pump, but he even said it, you know, the big two, uh, you know, boom, boom. It, and that's literally what Bitcoin did, almost erasing uh, most of, uh, you know, the the fallout that we saw. I mean, look at that oh, yeah. all the way up. I mean, it literally almost hit 25K. I mean, that's insane. The thing for me is I've been worried about Bitcoin since it came up over here. Couldn't get over the 200 week around uh, early February, came back down and then came back up in mid-February and, you know, got rejected again off the 200 week. I mean, yeah, we're coming to try to test it for a third time. And they say, you know, the more you knock on a door, the more likely it is to open. But I don't know. I mean, if we could, if we see this curl over right here, we could see a little like small head and shoulders start to play out where we've got, you know, one shoulder right here, a small head right here in the beginning of another shoulder right here and go, uh, go further down. So I agree with you. I would be cautious about, uh, this latest run and I won't, uh, I won't stop being cautious until we're well above the 200 week. Cause you know, as, if I bring the chart back up, you can see right here that this wasn't enough to be above the 200 week. You have a couple of wicks right here. And if you only observe on like smaller time frames, you know, maybe you might have got excited because it would have looked, you know, you have some more candles. Let's see. You have some more candles above it. You might start getting excited on something like this, but you really, really, really don't want to start investing a lot until, in my opinion, at least, of course, not financial advice, but until we're above this 200 week moving average, because as I've said many times on the show before, this 200 week moving average has acted as historical support for crypto the bull market at large i mean this is bitcoin going all the way back to the beginning of the 200 week uh, moving average on june of 2015 it landed on that at the you know after it had its peak in 2013 it landed on the 200 week in 2015 after the peak in 2017 we landed on the 200 week in 2018 uh, during the covid crash we still we had a couple wicks below but the bodies of these candles themselves landed on the 200 week it's really only till now that we got rejected off the 200 week in august of 2022 and rejected again now so in my opinion we are still in a bear market until we get back above this uh so to re-emphasize what you said long story short be careful out there yeah, definitely a lot of volatility probably going to be happening this week, especially because you know there's still some more headlines that are probably going to come out, some more big news drops. We have CPI tomorrow. You have rates coming next week. I mean, I mean, plus you got to think of the contagion that could come. I mean, maybe it's going to be mitigated because the government's coming in to backstop these deposits. But, you know, just look at the banking sector. I mean, if we pull these charts back up, hammered. These, these are all banks right here. This is this is First Republic Bank. It's acting like a means uh, meme stock. Let's see. From, yeah, from, I saw someone tweeting, uh, look at this shit coin. <laughs> it's for, for, First Republic Bank. From low to high, that's a 93% ni yeah. drop. Then we've got uh, Western Alliance Bank Corporation. They, they've got some banks in their, you know, in their portfolio as well. We've got, see, high to low, 95%. We've got uh, PacWest Bank Corp, same situation right here. Yep. Uh, recent high for you know early February 2022 to now 90% drop. Yeah. We've got uh, Zion's Bank Corp right here. Same thing. I mean, yesterday, I mean, basically Monday from the open, it's dropped a shit ton. But from the top up over here, that's a 70% drop. And then even some bigger banks. We've got Bank of Hawaii Corporation, which really hasn't been doing well since its top over here. It's down 50, 60 percent. We've yeah. got Charles Schwab, which is supposed to be a bigger bank, but from its peak over here, down also about 54 percent, and that's in the course of you know about a year. I mean, and if you just yeah. look, at, if you just look at from a day, or just about, just two days, yeah, a couple days, 40, 40 something percent, yeah, 44 percent a week or so. Like, Let's take a look real quick as well for the viewers. So while we still have some here on just the algo chart, obviously, I know we have a ton of people here. Let's let's chart that one up. I know we have a, I know we've obviously done the most, um, you know, charting for what Algorand's doing. And, you know, it had a nice little bounce back. I think it was like, um, let me see, four, maybe like 8% or 5%, somewhere in between there. Um, but, you know, that obviously is not good. We're still in that channel. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Here, this is my concern is we, we have been in this channel since about uh, September of 2021, and we had this break right here 
uh, in in early to mid February this year, and everyone kind of got excited. I, I started getting a little bit curious myself, not overly excited because I was concerned that this would happen. But we are back in this channel now, and if we don't break it, we're marching down back to sixteen. And if we break that, we're marching down to ten. I mean, there's just really no and the thing. And the thing I feel like it. that a lot of people, at least that I'm conversing with on crypto on crypto Twitter here, um, is not only do we have the you know obviously the horrible landscape right now of banking and USDD pegging and a lot of uncertainty in that side of the market, but Algorand is also still coming off of one of the biggest exploits with the Myalgo wallet. I know I, I gave a joke about your Myalgo flask there and, and obviously people say it got <laughs> drained too, but it, you know, it's re it's the real issue of where we're at. Right. I mean, and there's either, an there's even another 165 millions, uh, you know, exploit that happened in crypto. Like, it is like right now, I feel like is it's hard to be bullish. Like obviously Bitcoin pumping 14% in a matter of hours makes you want to be bullish. And it definitely made me want to FOMO into Algo uh, or into or obviously even some other ones. I mean, heck, Filecoin I'm in was up like 30%. I mean, there's tons of them, but it does make you question if this is just another dead cat bounce and if we need to be watching for something bigger. Yeah, I'd definitely be careful. I mean, right here on the RSI, you can see that we were rejected uh, many times. You know, this is basically the you know resistance line on the RSI. I could totally see Algo coming back and testing that again. So maybe we break out of this channel, which is denoted in this thick pinkish line right here. Uh, maybe we break out of it one more time. But honestly, the way it looks, I see us staying in this channel for a little bit longer. So uh yeah definitely be worried i mean not necessarily worried enough to sell your bags but worried enough where you're not opening up long positions because those could very easily get wrecked uh and short positions honestly now is really not the time for leverage because uh you're gonna get hit on both ends of them honestly if you're wrong definitely a lot of chaos in the market and obviously see had <laughs> to head out early but please he, don't uh, look at the algo eth chart yeah we don't <laughs> look at those <laughs> also actually honestly i should say thank you for saying something about that flask because i forgot it's it's just been there forever and you know i like the people over at my algo but there's no need to have them on screen and have people even go open up a wallet there right now while it's unsafe so yeah yeah no n none of that and, and obviously we still don't even know who the obviously there's no details as to who the exploit you know has been put on by we're still waiting for that obviously i watched cooper daniels live today and he had david garcia on uh kind of talking about the relief fund and I've, I've actually learned a lot about that lawsuit saga with crypto or with coop uh actually reading through a lot of the court docs on uh sunday he had a special and so if you didn't see that go back and watch it, it gives you a lot of info into that you know whole saga that might be going on and obviously the court docs are kind of one person's, you know, from one person's perspective. And then David kind of gave his perspective. But um, it just goes to show that even the technical prowess that Algorand has still at the end of the day, and this is kind of sucks. I don't even know what your thoughts are, but it's still the people behind it, right? The people funding this there's still corruption, right? And I'm not saying David Garcia is a corrupt individual. I like him. I think he's been great for the Algorand ecosystem, but it just goes to show that there can be things going on behind the great tech that end up ruining it. I mean, he even mentioned that, you know, how, or I think he said something like, how often does the better tech not win? I was just watching a video a couple of days ago about, you know, like Nikola Tesla, right? And his invention about how to get, you know, use the earth's uh, you know, to actually create electricity, free electricity, right? But that was squashed by, you know, the bankers of the world and the investors of the world, knowing that they controlled the ability to charge everybody for electricity. And obviously, I'm not going to get into a, you know, huge debate there, but it just goes to show that, you know, the great tech maybe doesn't always win, even a lot yeah, of the it investors in the Algorand ecosystem, Michael Arrington being one of them, it's literally on his uh, description of Algorand uh, and, and a lot of things he's wrote up is, you know, Algorand's great. It does what it does amazing. Um, but right now, as far as market share and and people using it, it's it's still at the bot, you know, very lower on the totem pole. And so, yeah, I'll be uh, honest, you know, if if Algo came out in like 2017 or 2018, it would be uh, it would be uh, it would be a top dog. But it unfortunately started getting its legs when there was a lot more competition in the market. So it's going to it's just going to have a harder time standing out. It does do it. Ha it is great technology. Uh, it may be was great technology a slightly late to the to the rat race uh, so to speak but uh you know overall i personally still think that we all too often talk about these conversations in a way of winner takes all yeah and i still don't think there needs to be a scenario where like algorand doesn't even need to be a top 10 coin 
to make people a lot of money. You know what I mean? Like yeah. it, it could very well easily be a top 20 or top 30 coin while the market itself grows exponentially and it's still a win-win for everybody holding. So yeah, I agree. And Hey, for all those still paying, uh, tuning in and watching we on Wednesday of this week at, I think we did have to move the time. It's going to be 2 PM instead of our normal show at 1 PM. We're actually going to have John Woods and Jess, uh, which is the new CMO of the foundation, uh, on the show to talk. And I'm really interested to ask her some questions about, you know, what it's like coming into the Algorand ecosystem during like literally <laughs> like not even Algorand, just crypto in general, the worst one of the like worst fair yeah. markets like the worst just overall uh you know yes, sentiment sir. levels are very far down and so i'm interested to see what you know from a mind stand of like what she's doing uh to try to help algorand obviously accomplish and get over some of those hurdles so it'll be a great episode make sure you tune in on wednesday at two um yeah I, we did see that one click nodes we are obviously going to be asking him all about that looks like it's coming out in the second quarter uh of this year so that will obviously be really exciting absolutely and so be sure to like be sure to be sure to subscribe excuse me and hit that notification bell so you don't miss when we go live so uh, like uh, david said we've got the cto and the cmo of the algorand foundation We'll be asking about one-click nodes. We'll be asking about Algo Kit. We'll be asking about how crazy the Algorand ecosystem is right now, and how the marketing team is gonna, you know, get us out of this mess, uh, so to speak. So, uh, thanks for everyone to join uh, for joining us for this episode. It was fantastic talking to Mark. I think we all learned a lot. He always brings a nice little history lesson with him. Oh, uh, yeah. And as you know, we'll see you uh, two days from now at uh, two p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Yep. Peace, everybody.